Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that if we all work together, there is time still to create the future we would be proud to leave to the generations that come after us. And that's what this podcast is for, to bring to your ears, to your imagination, the magical, creative people who can see and feel the awe and wonder in the world and use them to jettison us all out of the old, failing, horribly toxic system that we built around ourselves, largely by default, I think, and who can help us to imagine what it looks like to replace that with something that works for people and planet. I'm Manda Scott, and I'm your host in this journey into possibility. And this week, I am so delighted to bring you one of my newer heroes. Alan Lane is the artistic director of the theatre company Slung Low, which in turn is one of the most innovative theatre companies in the country, if not the world. Absolutely embedded in the neighbourhood in which they work, Slung Low are committed to their core principle of be kind, be useful. Everyone gets to do what they want and nobody gets to tell anybody else what they can't do. Within reason, as you'll hear. Alan is also the author of the book The Club on the Edge of Town, which is subtitled A Pandemic Memoir, but is so much more than this. It's the story of how Slung Low became a food bank during the pandemic, of the principles that underlay it and of the difference it made to people's lives. It's one of those books that I bought 10 copies of, genuinely, to hand out to everybody I could think of who might possibly read it over Christmas and New Year last year. If you haven't read it already, definitely put this on your reading list. It's one of the most inspiring of the books that I've read recently, but it's also really hard-hitting as to the nature of what privilege is and how those of us who have it can use it in ways that can make a difference in the world. And that's what Alan does. They're no longer at the club on the edge of town, but Slung Low was part of the team that put together the amazingly magical opening event of the Leeds Year of Culture 2023, when the city's most famous pop star spoke to a god that rose out of the river. So this is what Slung Low does. They make awe and wonder happen, and they do it with commitment and integrity and enthusiasm and raw inspiration that I believe really comes across in this conversation. So people of the podcast, please do welcome Alan Lane, Creative Director of Slung Low Theatre Company. Alan, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast. It is such a pleasure to invite you to come and talk to us in the midst of everything that you are doing. And you have probably the busiest, most applied, most engaged life of anyone that I've ever spoken to. So what is most alive for you in your world at the moment? Uh, at the moment, it's, it's really nice to be here, by the way. Um, at the moment, we are moving into our second space. So we, we now run two theatre spaces, one of which is called The Warehouse in Holbeck, which is a big warehouse space and has two stages in it. We've, we've got that ready nice. and we opened it oh, about a week ago uh, with an orchestra piece, which was great. Um, and we were full and that was really great to have classical music here. Uh, and then we have a second space, which is called uh, Sunglow Temple, which is uh, a space for other artists, really. It's offices and making spaces for younger artists. Probably not younger anymore, it has to be said, but younger artists and an outdoor younger than us uh, well, yeah, longer, <laughs> younger, yeah definitely um and then an outdoor performance space so we I literally came from the guys that were just we we have a double decker bus that's a classroom and we were shampooing that and you know doing stuff we were pretty so we, we're sort of nesting feels like that's where we are feels like we're building new actually nesting is a bit passive for what we're doing we're building new homes where we're, we're building the the base ready for what comes next, I think. That's definitely the case. I'm watching birds nesting around here and it's it's quite an active process. Yes. So, 
let's let's take a few steps back because the club on the edge of town is one of the most transformative books of last year. It was it was absolutely on my must read list for 2022. But you were in the club at the edge of town there, yeah, and now you're not, yeah. So can we fill in everybody a little bit on an edited highlight history of Slung Low? Yeah. Actually, I have an idea. Let's go back to the story of standing in the rain because that's how you open the book, and it is utterly iconic of who you are and how you are and and you were not yet at the club at the edge of town mm. then so i realize it's not where your life is at this moment but just for a moment let's step back into standing in the rain what that was and how it became your motto so we so we used to have a project which was a, a silver airstream caravan uh, that was called the, uh, the Knowledge Emporium, which was a sweet shop with a difference. And the difference was it didn't take money. It traded sweets for knowledge. And if you went into this suite, you would meet us. Uh, we were wearing sort of candy-striped waistcoats and bowling shoes. And we would say, write something in our great big book of knowledge and help yourself to sweets. And then at the end of our residency in a place, one or two weeks, we would then read that knowledge back to the people who would come and gather. And we'd play games and make food and stuff. The first time we ever did this was in Portobello Market, right down the bottom of Portobello Market in, in Notting Hill for a theatre called The Gate. And when we arrived there, no one would talk to me at all. They would come nowhere near me. And, and when finally I got hold of this woman who ran a laundrette and said, why, like, this free sweets? She was incensed because she knew that we were coming to steal her stories like Richard Curtis had in the past. Right, it had happened before. Which, yeah, which, which is if you, if you know that area at all, down the bottom of Notting Hill is a, m- a million miles away from the sort of Hugh Grant, Julia Roberts, or whoever it is, sort of world. It's not the Notting Hill we say when we say the Notting Hill set. It's not luxuriously middle class. It's much more challenging than that. And she was furious and with me because I was obviously a part of this world, which is hysterical. If you know me, anything about me, you know that I am also a million miles away from Richard Curtis. But I'm just some buffoon in a bow tie stood outside this silver caravan. And I said, well, the deal was we were, we were going to stand here and trade sweets for knowledge. So I'm just going to get on with doing that. And then it starts to rain. And it rained like the end of the world. It rained for hours and it came down so hard. And it occurred to me sort of quite, because we'd spent a lot of time making this really nice caravan and with this project, I thought it was good, would kind of be one of those few projects you do where no one can be angry with you because you're just giving away sweets. Turns out lots of people can be angry with you even when you're just giving away sweets. So I stood, I just stood because I kind of thought, well, the deal was that we were going to do this and I never at any point said, well, I'm only going to do it whilst the sun's shining. And so I stood and I stood and I stood and I stood there for a really long time and I got unbelievably wet. And I mean, really like comically wet, the clothes were falling off me. And finally she kind of came out, this woman from the, from the laundrette with a, with an umbrella and said, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm doing exactly what I said I was doing. Like I'm standing out here training suits. She was like, don't be stupid. And I was like, I, I'm just literally keeping my word. I'm just, I never said I wouldn't stand in the rain. And so, and she gave me the umbrella and, and there's kind of a resolution of sorts that two weeks later, actually, when we left, we'd got to know all the local businesses and they, they, if they didn't like us they certainly didn't hate us anymore they all you know they sort of they'd written in the book and and they and they came to see the show and so standing in the rain became this sort of shorthand for if we make a promise we have to fulfill that promise right. and one of the promises we made was that we would our job would be to to make sure that the people of Holbeck the most amazing place in the world Holbeck is an inner city South Leeds ward it was the heart of the industrial revolution for about two and a half seconds it, it's full of brilliant people but it's also been whacked by every single economic social financial development in the last hundred years like post-war decline smacked it thatcher smacked it the 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 departure of industry smacked it the covid smacked it austerity smacked it and now the hostile environment is absolutely jumping up and down on what's left of it and so it's that place it has the single worst health outcomes of any ward in england before we get there, can we get to how you got from Portobello Road mm. to Holbeck? And just before we get to that, can we t- just rounding the standing in the rain story off? So the lady yeah. who sounds like she's the matriarch of the area yeah. gave you an umbrella mm-hmm. so you could huddle underneath it yeah. in your clown suit. And then you got some good stories. Did the project in the end garner amazing stuff and give people a sense of worth, which I guess is what you were trying to do? Yeah, I mean, that that project went for years. That project was this kind of single most successful popular thing we did. Um, 
because it turns out that people really like sweets and they really like being told that they, that they know something. They really like being told that they're important. And and actually, the, the showings, I mean, we did that for four, four years or something. That, play, that played to 50, 60 towns or cities over those years. And wherever it went, it was popular because it didn't cost anything because it gave you free sweets and because then it took what you knew and it and it elevated it to something worth declaring in public, which, of course, me and you know, it was always worth declaring in public in the first place. We just don't right. well. Um, so, so that project was really was really successful for us. But but all the time we were doing that project, we were still based in Holbeck. We were still based in this place. And we, we had five railway oh, arches. Sure. Yeah, we've been here for 12 years. And we had five railway arches. You're originally from London, are you not? No, I'm a forces brat. So I grew up in in army bases and RAF bases um, around the world. Oh, okay. I've lived in Yorkshire since I was 18, but but that's still, if you ask any Yorkshireman, they will make it clear that that, yeah, it doesn't count in any way, yeah, shape or form. Yeah, that doesn't count. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've been Holbeck for 12 years and we moved there originally because it was the cheapest place to get large space like that was we got five railway arches right at the very edges of town near the city center and we shared that space with other theater companies and during that time we didn't know anything about Holbeck until we discovered things about Holbeck and we came to love it for all the reasons I just explained that it is the place that history drops in once in a while to leave its mark and then it clears off leaving everyone to kind of deal with the with the damage it became our community and we our commitment our new you know like our long-term thing that we would stand in the rain for was that we would endeavor to give the people of Holbeck the best cultural life they could possibly imagine and there's lots of ways in which we try and do that and many of them co-curated and many of them not and uh but one of the ways was we moved into the oldest working men's club in Britain over as managers uh four and a bit years ago now what was wrong with the railway arches? Because that sounds rather chic and lovely. Railway arches. It, it, is that my middle class projection of it being chic? No, and it wasn't. It wasn't ever chic and lovely. But it was. But it was really good, and it was cheap, and it was big. And then, and then, two things happened. One of which was Network Rail sold every single railway arch in the country to an asset fund, a hedge fund. Sorry. No. And what you've seen in London is uh, the the new landlords have raised the rent by four hundred, five hundred, six hundred percent. So a lot of the kind of small-scale, low-cost uh, industries that were in there, so um, family uh, mechanics and things like that, things that where you just kind of have been got rid of because eventually they're going to be turned into, you know, the new place for Wagamamas and what have you. And that didn't happen in Leeds, but we were suspicious that it might. And it probably would, except for um, COVID happened, and that put a kibosh on lots of things. But the other thing that happened was that so, so that venue, the hub, it was called, was always in the Guardian, was always being talked about by the arts people, and lots of people would come. But in order to get there from Holbeck proper, you have to walk through like a wasteland, like a place where really the only things that happened are violence and crime. And right. no matter how nice we tried to make it, people would arrive and they would come and they'd be like, God, oh, can you not afford heating? And we were like, it's a railway arch. We absolutely cannot afford heating. And so what was seen as rather chic and lovely by some people who had cultural capital, who understood that you give up a bit of, say, comfort in order to have something a bit more uh, interesting, Mm. that wasn't true of the people of Holbeck because they were like, well, if you're our theatre, how come you're crap? Like, the work was good, but why can't we have nice ice creams? And you were like, because, oh. And so that's, that's a really useful and perfectly valid challenge is... You understand the alternative only once you've grown comfortable with the mainstream, and they've never been offered the mainstream. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so, all this working men's club in England turns up, and how did that become available? Because it's not the kind of place where you would imagine a fairly right-on theatre company would end up. Well, at working men's clubs, for those uh, of your listeners who aren't in, in Britain, are uh, community-held pubs basically but they started in the victorian times and they were places like the holbeck where they were places for education and entertainment and they didn't have bars but they would be owned by members who would pay a fee like a a dues every year and then they would that would be their place to go and relax when they started they were entirely for men and given that it was 1900 in leeds entirely for white men so there's a kind of there's a challenge and a problem in their origin story but they were places beyond the market they didn't make profit. They were owned by the community and they were for entertainment and they were for uh, education. So what we might now call culture, 
Hmm. And then during the 20th century, they, they have financial problems because working men are paid less and therefore can't, and also there's cinema and television and all sorts of things start to happen. Um, and so they put bars in so that when you bought beer, the profits then went to run the club. Right. And definitely post-war, there is a kind of, wow, someone's managed to make uh, the inherent problem of alcoholism in the working man they've managed to find a positive out of that, which is if these blokes are going to go and kill themselves with booze anyway, we might as well sell them the booze from a community-owned point of view because then we can send all their kids to ho- on holiday for two weeks in the summer, which is what used to happen. So again, like there's lots of challenge in that. There is lots that's problematic. However, you do what you can, and they did what they could. So by the time we arrive, all clubs and pubs generally, but especially clubs, are on the decline because of the smoking ban, because people don't go to the pubs anymore. And so this place owed a lot of money. And it was being run by volunteers who were, it's fair to say, most of them elderly or older. And they've been doing it for a long time. And barrel work and toilets. And and they'd done a really good job. Mm. They'd done a really good job. And they'd managed to get to the point where they weren't losing money anymore. But they weren't making any money. And they weren't paying it. And they had a lot of debt. And debt racks up without doing anything to it. Yeah. Okay. Capitalism working as intended. Yeah, absolutely. This is like, and, and also because the market can't sustain a pub in Holbeck. Your people are too poor. They are too Muslim. They are too come from a culture that don't have drinking to to be able to make your living selling beer and using the profits to do anything else. So they just, it's just a really bad idea. So we were in there. We were rehearsing a kids show, and they have a but this if this amazing performance space. Uh, you know, it's a two hundred and fifty seater cabaret space above. To two, three lounges with a bar and a flat. So there's an awful lot of capacity and capability there. And we were rehearsing in their up rooms that, that they, their events room that they didn't do anything with anymore because it, it took too much time and, and no one really had the energy. And they'd left their bank accounts out. And our producer, Joanna, kind of noticed it and kind of put two together, two, two, and two together and said, well, we could move in. And this is a deal we offered them. We're going to move in and we're going to pay all your debts off. And then we're going to come in as managers and guarantee you against loss. So how did you pay off the debt? As I remember from the book, there was something about you'd gone round the north of England going, we don't want the government grants until the people here have actually got proper stuff. And then you thought, actually, here's a useful use for the grant. Do I remember that right? Because £80,000 is a lot of money to suddenly come up with. That's a, that's a lot of money. So there's a thing called theatre tax relief, which is what the Conservatives would rather fund the arts with. So if you, if me and you are rich people, we decide that we are going to make um, Peter Pan the musical with, I don't know, someone off the telly. The government will give us, in cash, 20% of everything that we spend. It's slightly more nuanced there, but not. But bottom line is, we will get 20% of it until first night. So all the money we spend in R&D, all the money we spend in rehearsals, all the money we spend building sets, everything else, we're getting 20% in cash back. Right. That's not a write-off against tax. That's actual money. And then if it makes no money, if it in fact only has one night, you've still got that money. It's a way of funding the arts in which Android Webber gets more money than your favourite local community theatre company. And that's not great. Because actually, what we probably want, because subsidy isn't about priming the pumps, it's not about market correction. It's about understanding that culture sits beyond the market and we will collect our commonwealth and then we will divvy it up so that the, the, the flattening effect of the market does not happen in our cultural life. I love that. Really, basically, if you spend, if you need £25 to go and watch Hairspray in the city centre, then in a city like Leeds, which is the kind of one of the more successful cities in Leeds, at least a third of the population are not going to be able to afford to do that. So you, right from the start, and specifically for us, the kids through that wall is Ingram Road Primary School, 450 amazing kids who live incredibly precarious lives in large part because of capitalism, in large part because of the hostile environment, who would not have access to any genuine cultural life beyond some very slim pickings if it was not for public subsidy of the arts. Okay. So if you then go along and say, actually, guys, it's actually I've thought of an even better way. You spend the money and we'll give you 20% cash back. That's not great. It, it, it's not great. It's a particularly conservative party thing to do to arts funding. So I had 
gone around and said what I just said, but in slightly more colourful and vibrant language for quite some time. And then we went and we did a big show for whole 2017 that had a, a had part of it went on to the BBC at nine o'clock on Saturday. And we spent nearly a million pounds. Whoa. It's a lot of money on the show, which was seen by half a million people. It was incredibly successful. People enjoyed it. It was on, it was a, it was a four and a half hour, uh, blank verse epic about immigration on a floating stage on water with 250 people in it that split apart, burst into flames, disappeared. And then the final act was a, a naval battle between 11 different ships, boats, all powered by members of the community that threw grenades and wow. spoke at each other. So it's a thing like, yeah, you can see where the money went. But in any case, we did this thing and it was great. Everyone loved it. Everything was brilliant. And then um, Joanna, the producer, pointed out to me that we were owed £80,000 worth of theatre tax relief. Right. And I obviously said, well, we can't take that because I've been gobbing off for the last two years. We don't believe in it. And almost on the same day, it became clear that the club owed £80,000 debt Hmm. to breweries, basically. It's too long to go into, but breweries are really good at racking up debts against pubs because it it then binds them into never being able to buy anyone else's beer, which then, because the price of beer actually um, depends on who you are, depends on how much you pay. So then they can increase the price of beer so that your profit margin... Yeah, anyway, it's a whole thing. It's capitalism doing its thing, right? Yeah. In any case, so there's this moment where we're going to get the theatre tax relief of 80 grand and the club owes 80 grand. Marriage made in heaven. Yeah. It occurs to me that... Exactly. Aslan is making a point. <laughs> he would like me... He would like us to do this. So that's the offer we make to the club. We're going to pay off all your debts. We're going to move in as managers. You don't, we don't get paid for that. We're going to run the place... You write down what you want to stay the same. So they, they picked opening hours. The price of beer couldn't be raised without a vote by the members. And then the rest of what you don't sort of protect, we're going to turn into a pay-what-you-decide arts and community centre. And then finally, the last thing is we'll guarantee you against loss. So when we get to you've not made any money. You're not going to make any money. But when we get to the end of the year, we'll pay off your debts always. And then that way you're never going to fall into debt again. And then we can stay here. Wow. What an offer. Okay. So they ripped your hand off, which is perfectly reasonable. Mm, sort of. But yes, they, they did. They, most of them were like, yes. I mean, the alternative was us or closure. And, and still having a lot of debt. So you got in and you did astonishing stuff. And you had as your principal three founding values. Do you want to tell us about those and then tell the good things that how they were applied and moving into COVID particularly what you did with those? Yeah, I mean I mean we were we were at the club for four years and we had f- four amazing years. We were really proud of them. We talked about really basic values that my son can understand when running the club because like I say we're in a culture war. So like they need to be simple because you're only ever going to get to talk for ten seconds before someone starts shouting. And the first was be useful and the second was uh be kind. And then the third was everybody gets what they want, but nobody gets to stop other people getting what they want. And this is a, this is the crux of it, which is if you need to use the room upstairs for your, you're going to, you're welcome. You can have the room and it's going to be on a pay what you decide basis. So it's basically free, but the idea that you can say as a member, but I don't want Africans to use it is just absolutely like, no, I, you can use the, you can, you know, if you want your, Nana's 70th birthday is an example of something we did quite a lot of on the Friday. I will be there and I will make sure everything's working and the gang will make sure that the system's on and we will hoover up after you. But when there's a queer cabaret in the next night, I don't want to hear from you about how it's disgusting or any or anything else. I simply don't. That as long as you were willing to obey the kind of basic um, kind of social norms, you were welcome. And, and they were, they were set really, the bar was set really low for basic social norms. Basically, don't be a Nazi. They literally, we had some Nazis. We had to throw them out. They were really upset. And I said, you're a Nazi. And they said, but you said everyone was welcome. And I was like, except Nazis. You're the one group. <laughs> because, but what a great, because but they were they were so upset. They were like, but, but. And I'm like, no, dudes, you are the epitome of not letting other people have what they want, right? That if your values and your standards are such that it stops other people getting this, 
basic human rights. And I'm kind of interested in you being upstairs in my space. Get out. And they were like, freedom of speech, man. I thought you were. <laughs> yes. For everyone but Nazis, there's freedom of speech. You can literally, and we did. People who hated me who would stand up in our space and be rude about me. And I'd be like, yeah, that's actually allowed. Right. Until you start chatting absolute nonsense about white supremacy. And then you can just get out before I lose my temper. So White male straight supremacy. Yeah. Because I remember you telling me that you had the um, the only LGBT women's football team, m- w- Muslim women's football team up there, which is, is yeah. amazing. I, I remember you saying they weren't very good at football, but they won all the fights in the car park. They did. And me thinking, is that a good thing? <laughs> but this is the, this really hard, this culture of democracy. So, so if someone came to us and wanted to start a football team and they wanted it to be entirely accessible, so we paid for childcare, we paid for travel, we paid for care. And what that meant was the women's team quite quickly became uh, an asylum seeker immigrant uh, team. Uh, Women from all over the country, uh, all over the world, sorry, who ended up in Leeds, played football together. And they they often were not very good at football, but they were really, really ferocious. And all of that is, yeah, all of that is challenging, right? You're like, hang on a minute. If if the bloke's football team started beating everyone up in the car park, we'd have a big problem. But these these are nuanced and difficult questions. Like, mm. I will always end up on the side of this is a group of women who have bonded so well that they're willing to protect each other. So I was like, do you know what? I also, not my problem. Um, they, they're grown women. If they want to scrap, uh, they can do. They, they're brilliant. Uh, they're, they're, they're called Holbeck Moore FC. And, um, and they still exist? Yeah, they still exist. Um it was really good. But in the in the club, so in the club, so we had these rules, which meant that basically we said yes to everyone. And the, and the most important thing is the theatre companies, we told everyone about these rules. So we did f- f- leaflet drops and PR campaigns and all sorts. So everyone got to know that if you had an event that needed a space, then you could have it at our place. And that meant that everybody came. So the Ghanaian weddings and the Nigerian funerals and the Irish Holy Communions and the queer cabarets and the rehearsals and the band nights. And it, we kind of had everyone and, and we didn't, we didn't program. We didn't curate. We just said yes. Wow. Yeah. With so little exception. Nazis, we said no to. And, and what was really um, exciting about that was everything worked with its, within its own conditions. So some people come and say, I want to do a, a, a band night because my mate's bike got nicked and I want to raise the money to get a new bike. And we'd be like, yeah, okay, that's great. And the bands would not be necessarily what me and you, and it wouldn't particularly be well organized. And it would start an hour late and it would come down an hour late and all of that. And people loved it. People genuinely had a good time. And that was true of nearly everything that we were doing, that, that for its own community, it was really successful. The only things that didn't work is when people felt like they had to do something. So, fundraisers for political parties always went down really badly because no one really wanted to turn up to them. People just felt like they had to have, I think that's a great lesson for theatre. And then alongside all of this use, we put stuff on. So we had big cabarets, drag queens, magicians, opera companies. Um, uh, A week, every week, a a new play would come touring in and then every kind of six weeks we'd do a big cabaret or a big kind of community event and they were, everything was pay what you decide and they were incredibly popular how many of you are there alan because this sounds you're already there hoovering up after mm. the band that's been an hour late and everybody else who's been dropping their fag ends on the carpet i imagine while they're drinking beer downstairs yeah and you're putting on all of these shows how big is Slung Low and how do you find your energy? How do you recharge yourself? There's four of us and, and that's a really good question and I think increasingly um, post-COVID that's a really good question for us. I think if, if, if the other three were here they would all answer this very differently. They're all motivated in a completely different way. How I charge myself is that I know that we have you know, £500 million worth of money to spend on public art and publicly subsidised theatre in this country and we don't spend it in a way that is in any way conducive to changing the world for the better. And it makes me angry. That's based on the assumption uh, that the kids of Ingram Road Primary School, the kids of Holbeck, wouldn't know what to do with it if they had it. Now, I have lived a life that absolutely proves that not to be the case. That actually, if you if you trust them with... We have a group of young primary school kids who curate and commission for us, spend proper cash, thousands of pounds every year, and they do a brilliant job. And the injustice of how we spend our public arts money is so profoundly cruel as to be unbearable, except for to do something about it. And so... 
the injustice that Holbeck didn't have a public space that everybody could use was too much to bear. And that fueled us for at least two years, I'd say, the absolute fury of that. Until COVID, and until the pandemic hit. Tell us a little bit, because I want to move on to what you're doing now, which sounds even more exciting. But tell us just a little bit about what happened during the pandemic and how you shifted the theatre company. So COVID hit and we had to shut the club because nearly all the people who drank in our club were old. And they would have immediately died, um, even if they were, they were. They were so angry when we shut the club. They left lots of very offensive uh, voicemails telling us we'd betrayed them. But in any case, shut we did. And then um, we put a letter out to our nearest 200 households that said that, like, that we knew everyone was scared, but we were still there. We were young enough to kind of not be terrified. And we had a van and we had money. And if, we needed, if they needed help, they should get in touch. And they did. They needed their dogs walking and prescriptions picking up and groceries and all sorts of other stuff. And then the council got in touch and said, could we do that for our whole ward, which is about 7,500 households. And there's four of you. Yeah, at the time there were five of us, but yes. And so, and, and, and we did, and we did that for ooh, a year and a half. And, and, and so if you were in trouble in South Leeds, you would ring the council and you'd be put through to us. And then we would go and do your stuff. And we, we changed beds and we moved wheelie bins and we, we did the things that your family and friends might do for you, except for your family and friends weren't allowed to. And then really quickly, we became a food bank. Really quickly, it became clear that there was a loud and obvious and demonstrable need for free food in our community. And then all of this moved pretty quickly. And, and, and it's fair to say that large parts of this new responsibility from the council was unfunded. So they were saying, like, can you do this? And here's four quid. And we were like, cool, it's going to cost lots. And they were like, we haven't got lots. And so it became really clear to us that that's fine. It was a moral obligation. It was, you know, we believe in public service and it was an act of public service. But we were going to do it our way. So we became what they call a non-means-tested self-referral food bank, which means that if you ask for food, you're going to get it, which is different from how food banks work. You normally have to demonstrate your poverty in one way or another. And one of the ways you demonstrate your poverty is by getting an agency or an organization to say that you are hungry enough for food. So you might be a local church or a social worker or whatever. And the problem with that is that um, all of that system's completely exhausted. So just trying to find someone who had the brain space to be able to meet you and say, oh, yeah, you're hungry. It's like it doesn't exist. So the whole system is, is messed up. And it's all a bit moral. It, it assumes a moral failing in you as opposed to a systematic outcome that was predetermined. Right. The deserving and the undeserving poor, which seems yeah. to be a, a big yeah. Tory theme, the undeserving poor. It's like, how did you even get that idea? But it still seems to be ingrained. OK. Yeah. And, and the idea that if only you'd made better choices or, or that there were better choices available to you or just, oh, it's just so boring. It's, and it's all just so tedious. So we just went, no, I'm not having this. So we just said, if you ask for food, you, you're going to get it. And, and as a result, we did 15,202 food parcels in I can't remember what it was, 15 months, which is a lot, which is, which is when you think we were getting maybe three or four official referrals a week and we were delivering 400 food parcels a week. There is a discrepancy between the official and the informal. And the people who really needed it. And where did you get the food from? Because it doesn't just drop out of the sky. No, we were really, I mean, when you say we did this, we did this with an amazing army of volunteers. And so the local churches dropped off food and... There is an amazing man called Alan Smith who runs the Real Junk Food Project, which goes into the food supply chain and finds, you know, there, there, is, there is enough food, it's just in the wrong places. So there's food that will get thrown away and that people will have to pay to dispose of that is not being given to people. And so he goes in, gets that food, and, and then so actually he sells it. He sells it to people. Um but he gave it to us. Because it was out of date or just because he had... Some of it is, but some of it was also that, that our supply chains are so messed up that the tiniest of things can mean that an articulated lorry of milk is no longer needed. Well, COVID wasn't the tiniest of things, right? So there was, there was airport hangers worth of food that all of a sudden didn't have the home that it was. And so we would have stuff, genuine articulated lorries would turn up and they would be full of stuff and we'd just have to get rid of it. Wow. So it, it wasn't a balanced diet, but it was a varied one. So it might be, you know, a popcorn bag the size of me. I'm six foot three, and this pop bag, popcorn bag was, and we had a fat, you know, five hundred of them, or or ten thousand frozen Burger King burgers. And you're like, 
fuck am I meant to do with these? Um, and you have to get them out before they defrost. Yeah, that was a that was a long day. And milk is a big one. Milk to dispose of milk, you can't pour it down the drain, not in proper volume, because it clogs the drains up. So you so you have to pay to get rid of it. So you know, on Monday that thing might be worth five grand, and on Wednesday that thing might cost you four grand to get rid of. Wow. Well, that's a lot. That's a big swing, right? right? And so he's in the middle of all of that, being a magician, and we would just sort of burst through. The council gave us some money for food as well, and then we spent all our all our money. Like we spent our money. Like we earned lots of money. Wow. We make. Well, I mean, we make big shows. They're seen by lots of people. We get paid for that. And so we had money in the bank, and so we spent it on, on food, which I don't regret at all. Um, I'd like the money back. But what happened to these people? When the end of COVID and you're a theatre company, you can't keep being a non-means-tested self-referral food bank forever, partly because the other food banks are going to get crossed because you're not following the system, I kind of guess. What happened to the people who needed the food at the end? Well, I mean, we had a very... I mean, closing a food bank is much harder than setting one up. Right. Uh, so we it took a lot longer. So we had months of writing. You know, we would send letters to people saying, look, at the minute we notice that we're delivering to you once a week, when in four months' time, we're going to stop. Um, there were schemes around uh, affordable supermarkets and around um, kind of uh, socially engaged grocers and all, all sorts of different things. It's fair to say there was this big explosion of, of this activity citywide and specifically in our ward. And, and the council did invest in it, but then a lot of the organisations that were carrying on that work were already on their knees and weren't being funded enough. And then someone came along and went, we'll give you 40 grand to do this. And they said yes. And then and then they carried on that work, but not in the same way and not with the same energy that we had. So it's definitely the case that people just got less food. And some of those people coped. And some of those people would have made different choices. It meant they had less in their life elsewhere. And some of those people would have gone hungry. There's absolutely no denying. Shutting the food bank was a really difficult for us mm. we left the world no worse than we found it right. we are in a period of actual decline like our societies are getting worse and that partly comes from mindset it partly becomes from a lack of investment and it, it partly partly becomes from a absolutely terrible government yeah the system is is crumbling i think that's a fundamental tenet of this podcast is we're in the middle of the system falling apart we just need to work out how to create the new one preferably before everybody becomes destitute in in the gap between so and you you feel to me as if you're you're in there because the, i think a lot of people feel we have to wait and see what the new one will look like before we can start planning for it and my feeling is no we just get on doing with what is right and the new one emerges out of that and we might not recognize it until it's in the rearview mirror and that's fine so because time is moving on, I really want to get to what you were doing at New Year and what you're doing now. Tell us a little bit, COVID comes to an end, you close the food bank. What happened at the Working Men's Club? Because at the end of the book, you're still, it's a pandemic memoir. What happened after the end of the book? Well, we, we opened the football club. So, so we realised that we were responsible to our community in many different ways um, and not just food. It has the single worst health, worst health outcomes of any ward in England. So adult activity became important to us. And we got back on with running running the club. And it, I think the problem had been that for 18 months, no one from the club, no one from the committee had come in. They tried to shut the food bank down because they thought the food bank would denigrate the reputation of the club, that people wouldn't want to come and drink in there. And so we cracked on, you know, we went back to what we were doing. And, and I've got to be honest, we were a little confused that there were now some people who hadn't been around for a year and a half, two years, who were now like, right, we're back. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're back, but the world's changed quite a bit. And there, there were clearly tensions. And one of those tensions was around, you know, how, how do we greet people of colour? Who, mm. uh, you know, how, do we, how, do we, how do we behave around people? Who, how are guests who are different, you know, whether they be queer or just, or just alternative? How do, we, how do we deal with them? Who does this club belong to? If the rules are that everyone who's a member, and that, you know the member had ex membership had exploded under our management to about four hundred and fifty from about one hundred and fifty, you know, all of a sudden there's three times as many people. Are we in fact servicing all of those people? Is that part of what we should be doing? How do we do it? And it became really clear that the the kind of committees and and a core, it has to be said, of about thirty or forty members were like, no, it needs to go back to how it was. And I was like, well, how it how it was fundamentally didn't work and the interesting thing is none of this was a change we didn't change opening hours we didn't change the price of beer we didn't change the beer 
this was part of the culture war. This was about the more nuanced question of who are we for and what do we do? It was philosophical rather than practical. If it had been about, you know, the, the, the price of beer, then that would be a really easy thing to fix. But, it, but it's not. It's about the idea that we'd been there for, well, I'd been a member for a decade, but I'd been actually living in one way or another in the club for, you know, four years and still wasn't seen as a member by any of the you're like you're not a member, and they were like, but, but no, by your own rules, members are people who pay six pounds a year, and I've paid my six quid. And we were basically working really hard, as you say, like we do lots of things. We we opened the Shakespeare North Playhouse, we made shows all around the country. We we, yeah. we were the co-directors of Leeds 2023 opening, and we're doing that and earning lots of money, and then putting all of that money into the club, and therefore, in a very real sense, literally subsidising the beer of people who tested us and couldn't keep the hate out of their face and it also became really clear that whilst we were there well, we were physically in the place right. everyone was welcome that was one of our things everyone's welcome but the minute we left we would then get phone calls from the staff and from saying oh this just happened or we had a huge problem with sexual harassment of the bar staff and it just got too much and we were like this isn't this isn't going to go on. There was a, there was a moment me and my boy, I've got a seven year old and my dog moved in over Christmas to run the place for a week to keep it open because we had no bell staff. And by the end of day one, I was like, Oh my God, we are really hated in this building. And I thought, well, that's, so we got together as a team as always and said, well, what are we going to do about this? So what we did was we went to the AGM happens every year. And we said to the members, you need to vote us out because if you don't vote us out, obviously the agreement will, will continue uh, uh, and we'd be liable for all their debts for a start. Um, but you can't survive. You cannot survive without radical change, without putting your beer prices up, without stop being rude to people. Like even, let's not even talk about racism and sexism. Let's just stop being rude to people who might want to come into this club and drink and have fun. And at first it was enough of the members who were like, no, hang on a minute. We're onto a really good thing with you. And we were like, absolutely not, we're going. And if you don't vote us out, then within the parameters of our agreement, I can do the following things. And I will do them all tomorrow. And at that point, they went, all right, fine, we'll vote you out. Because it was important, you know, they voted us in, it was important to us, they voted us out. But, and I suppose I mention all of that because and it was a harder edge. We, you know, the book is about us desperately trying to hold a middle ground between lots of different groups of people. And assuming as I think is right, that when we were failing to do that, it was because we were failing to do that. Yeah. But the world is complicated and actually no one's, we need to work together. There comes a point when this is, a, you know, the four years we had was incredibly successful. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people used that space. A place of genuine joy, a place of education and, and entertainment. And it did it. And it was brilliant. And we transformed it. And we paid off all its debts and we did a big renovation and it's in really good shape. So it- just briefly, before we head on to Lee's 2023 opening and the glory of that, the energetics of this seem really interesting because it seems to me that this is where the world is at, that there are people whose sense of tribal identity feels under threat. Mm. And because it's under threat, somebody quite bright said to me at the point when the dog died that grief is love that has nowhere else to go and that rage is fear that has nowhere else to go. And they're afraid because... Their way of life is over and they don't have the resilience and the grit and the imagination and the flexibility to imagine a different life for themselves or to imagine the world as it could be. And therefore they are angry and they need to voice that anger at yeah. somebody yeah. or something and you were their punch bag. And the fact that, you know, the, the thing that they had been angry about changes, they're still angry. So they, they just move the goalpost to wherever the goal happens to be. How, maybe this is an unfair question. But this is something I ask myself pretty much every morning. I do my shamanic ceremonies and there's a, I have a choice. I can put fear into the world or I can put compassion into the world. And if I'm given a choice, I'll go for the compassion and I'll endeavour to be part of Mm. that side of what seems to me quite a polarised balance. And it's hard because I still get really angry with the Tories and capitalism and the system. But you're living in it. And I'm wondering, first of all, how did the energetics of that impact on you. Being hated all the time, you know, Nicola Sturgeon, I think, one of the reasons she and Jacinda Arden both intelligently stepped down is that 
being the focus of energetic hate for a long period of time is extremely yeah. damaging. And the only people who thrive yes. in that are the utter psychopaths like Johnson, who somehow managed to feed on hate and it makes them bigger and brighter. And that having those people in charge is an extremely dangerous thing and having a system that elevates those people is functionally insane. But you're not one of those people. So I'm wondering how did you cope with the energetics of it? And then have you any insight on a larger scale how do we help these people not to be afraid and therefore raging in a system that is breaking down? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the really smart, smart question because I think that's that's in the end why we had to leave. Like, there's four of us and we all get paid the same and we're, we're, we are to all intents and purposes equal, as in each one of us is as important as the other. But my job is to lead, which is to point a direction. And you can't lead if you know no one will follow. And so it was absolutely clear to me that if we did not leave the club, I was going to be stood there on my own. Right. And that is not an act of leadership. That's an act of folly. And so it, it wasn't like me saying we should leave. It was me looking into the faces of the three people I work with. I'm like, they can't stay. And it was probably true of me, except for, you know, there wasn't a mirror. And, and in large part, that's because we were absolutely hated. And that meant that there's no good faith, which means that no matter what you do, it will be assumed that you have done something on purpose to annoy them. So recently, we, there was a meeting that we hosted here, and, and it was only a matter of seconds before people were on Facebook going, oh, now Sunglow were doing this. And you were like, oh, my goodness. I mean, all we said was, would you like a room? And that's because we're not real for them. We're, we're not real. We're a, we're, a, we're a cipher. We represent something. And the thing we represent is, is not, it's not the council, it's power it's authority so if you ask them they'd say well he's a posh lad well i'm not but it doesn't matter whether i am or not because i am to them we're not your standard theatre company we are not um we are not dripping with cultural capital and cultural status in the traditional sense i don't deny any of my privilege i'm just saying that as theatre company theatre directors go i'm pretty basic and pretty um practical whereas for them i just literally represent the kind of velvet curtain and the sort of you know it, it doesn't matter whether I go. I went to Oxford or Cambridge or not. I didn't, but for them, I I did. You know, I I am in place of them, and they can very easily hate me. Right. And but the same was true for like my colleagues, especially the women would often come in. You know, for what is just basic bullying. And if you would say to them, they would pride themselves on being men of good manners because they weren't bullying a woman. They were bullying someone who was, t they were, they were forever saying, well, you can't do anything. I'm like, no, you can do anything you want. You just have to take the consequences. They were, they were always trying to sell food and they'll have a license for food. And I'm like, if you sell this food and someone gets sick, the club will close. And they were like, now you're stopping us selling food. I'm not stopping you selling food. I'm just telling you the consequences of someone getting sick. So that really helps. It really helps to understand they don't hate you. They don't know anything about you. They don't hate you. I think that for as long as we could, we turned the other cheek. For as long as we could, I would be like, yep, suck it up, suck it up, fine, it's fine. We've got lots of cultural capital to burn, We've got lots of privilege to burn. And then at some point, you realize that that whole process is turning you into someone you don't want to be. Right. And then you've got to stop. And then I think everyone was really surprised by how hard-edged I became. They were like, what? And I'm like, well, yeah, because now you've just made my friends cry. So we are going to leave, and you are going to take it in the teeth. And that's that's life. And well, hang on. Yeah, and and you're with the uh, the Royal Marines Reserve. It's not that you're incapable of being quite grounded. I imagine when you really need to. I, I'm Royal Engineers Reserve. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. There'd just be literally a Marine appear in the window, but like, Bleh. but yeah. I I mean, I'm 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 a reservist with the Royal Engineers, and so I am capable and needs be of planting my feet and telling people the truth. Um, and that's really important because I think you know, and the two women that you cited as as examples of leaders are both capable of being um absolutely strong and immovable when they need to be because that is one of the things of leadership that doesn't mean that should be your only yeah. mode um and i think that it's used too often in certain circumstances but i but we'd reached the end and actually at some point the responsibility was was a duty of care for my team not for them so so the energetics are really hard i think it has absolutely changed us i think we're still you know we moved out five uh -huh. months ago we're still moving through the consequences of what it is to be shouted at for that long and what it does to you and what it does to your heart and what it does to, to you know to your risk taking and all of that stuff and i have sympathy so like i don't come from the background that they think i do and i absolutely know men who were promised things and they have had that promise rescinded on now with good reason lots of the time 
The promises were not valid, but that doesn't matter because they they mattered to them. They were promised. They were told work 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 a lifetime, and then you're going to sit here in this bar at that table and you're going to talk your shit. Now people have come along and said this way. It's like you can't say anything anymore. And my response to that is always, "What is it you want to say?" Hmm. And they never say anything, mate. They never do because it's so foul the thing that's coming out of their mouth that they know it's wrong. The thing that you can't say is so bad you won't say it to one person in the room who you think might disagree with you. You don't care what I think. Why don't you say it? You don't say it because you know it's despicable. How do we change this, Alan? You don't. How do we help them to not need to say that? You don't. It's done. It's a lifetime. You, these men are in their 60s and 70s, but that doesn't mean you give up. Do we have to just wait for what they call demographic churn? Because I don't know we've got that long. You, no, because the argument isn't. So I'm arguing with whoever it is, and I'm arguing that they're going to treat the bar staff with more respect. I'm never going to change his mind, but everybody's watching me. And I have a choice. If you go and you go, no, listen to me. This is a workplace. She's a woman. You're going to treat her with respect. You're going to, and, and I did. And I, for years I did. Over and over again I had these arguments. And I never got anywhere with them, but I never wanted, I never expected to. I'm being watched. I'm setting the standard of behavior that I will expect. And who am I? I'm absolutely no one. But if we all set the standard of behavior that we'd expect, we'd end up with something different. And, and absolutely in places like Holbeck, you get a tall poppy syndrome where, they, where you know, the minute you put your head above the parapet, you get smacked. Well, that is one way of checking your privilege, right? Like who do we want to go first over that? Well, that's what God made me for. I'm bloody huge, I'm white, I'm straight, I'm male, I'm all the things that are challenging and problematic, that's fine, I can't change any of those, what I can do is I can go first, I can be the one that you send to fight that guy over and over again, there is a limit to that, and the limit, we literally found the limit where it starts to eat your soul, but up until that point, that is my job, we will not change those people's minds, but we will be watched by people Okay, so the greater community learns a better way of behaving and more emotional literacy, perhaps, Hopefully. by watching you being emotionally literate. Hopefully. Okay, that's, that's, that's worth banking. Right, in the time we have left, you left the club, you've opened these new places. Tell us about Leeds 2023 opening and then where you are now. So the year of culture was um, was because we got thrown out of Europe. We were going to become the European capital culture and then we Brexited. And that's challenging but Leeds decided to do it anyway which is the most Leeds thing I've ever heard in my life it was absolutely hysterical they just declared themselves to be the non-European capital of culture and it's run by a brilliant woman called Calith Yari who's uh, used to be in charge at the National Theatre of Wales and um, and cast in Doncaster before that uh, and it's a and it's a year of it's a year of culture uh, as you would expect if you've ever been to any of those just like Hull and Commentary there is a a community programme Glasgow did it once in my youth Glasgow did it yeah absolutely and 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 it is doing all the things that you can't do otherwise. So Leeds is really blessed that it's got lots of great cultural institutions, but they tend to take up the bandwidth, whereas Leeds 2023 has come along and said, why don't we do all these other things that we don't normally have time to do, which is great. And I was a co-director of the opening ceremony, which was called The Awakening, which was announced 100 days before New Year's Day. And it was a really simple offer, which was there was to be a great concert of readings and music from the best of the city. And the only problem was you couldn't buy a ticket. You could only get a ticket if you submitted a piece of art to Leeds 2023 in any format, in any style, and then all the tickets would be drawn by way of a ballot. Now, by just by complete luck, this is a complete coincidence, the number of people who entered was the same as the number of tickets available. So everybody who entered got a ticket. And so they went along on the 7th of January to Headingley Stadium, which is a big rugby stadium, and there was this huge stage built with this runway and these big screens. Leeds hadn't seen anything like it in one of their sporting arenas. And there began a kind of relatively traditional but rather joyful evening of readings and poems, right? And, and, and songs that celebrated the best. But they all had a twist. So we had... Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba, but instead of Pete Pothelswaite at the beginning, we had uh, Davina De Campo. Chumbawamba didn't play, but Hope and Social and the orchestra from Opera North did. So you ended up with this big swirling kind of great new rendition. We had dancers in wheelchairs and carnival dancers and eight-year-old kids playing I Predict a Riot by the Kaiser Chiefs that transformed into this carnival version. And the Poet Laureate wrote a new poem. And, and it was great. There was, there was some brilliant rappers and some great poets there's this brilliant pair called testament and denmark who did this amazing kind of tour of leads through this epic poem 
And he was great. And we kind of, you know, Gabby Logan and Sanchez Payne were the hosts and they came out and they, in all the speeches, they made these big speeches about cultural democracy and co-creation and just all the good stuff. And then right at the very end, uh, Corinne Bailey Ray, who's a sort of, you know, multi-Grammy award-winning, like famous daughter of the, of the city came out and she sang her most famous song, which is great. And then she started her second most famous song. And right in the middle of that, all the screens went, everything went off, all the sound, everything went off. And then the BBC breaking news came on and the presenter said, I'm so sorry to interrupt the concert, but we have to go now to the river air. And now we're in a helicopter above the river air and there's lights moving in the river. It's dark. And then out of the river bursts a giant brick man. So a man made of brick and debris from the bottom of the river. And he roars and he shakes off the bricks and he becomes a body of light, like the DNA, uh, like the internet stood up. And he shouts that he is the sleeping giant of Leeds. He's the promise of the city that has been unkept. And he'd come tonight to do what was necessary. And then he exploded into a thousand shards of light and the screens all went dark and the lights came up on Corin Bailey Ray who looked at the audience and said, don't worry, I knew he was coming. I knew he'd come tonight. Let's welcome him. And then above the stadium in the sky, the face of the giant appeared kind of 100 meters high, a face made up of light. And then the giant spoke to Corin Bailey Ray and they had an argument about (laughs) cultural democracy. So, So the giant has appeared above us in the stadium and it's his huge face, kind of 100 meters high. And, and he declares that he's the promise of the city come. The city hasn't done enough to keep the cult kind of promise. It's a huge, giant potential of so much more. And he's come tonight to deal with things. And Corinne Bailey Ray, God lover, in front of 10,000 people in a rugby stadium says, what are you talking about? Like, I knew you'd come tonight. I knew, you'd, of course, Leeds is a massive city. Of course, we have huge promise. And I know we can do more if we trust in ourselves. Why else do you think... I filled the stadium full of artists. And the giant, bless him, up there is all confused. And he's like, what do you mean? She said, well, everybody here is an artist. They all got in tonight to watch this show by making a piece of art. And the giant finds this so delightful that he starts to laugh. And as he laughs, he disintegrates into kind of hundreds of shooting stars. And the audience on the way in had been given these plastic cones, these weird plastic things, and just said, hold on to them, you'll know what to do. And as the giant falls from the sky, all the cones light up in the colours of the giant. And and Corin Bailey Ray says, like, look, look what we did on day one. Can you imagine how great it's going to be on day 365? Here's to Leeds 2023. And fireworks burst into the sky. But what and and like what was amazing was we'd we'd written that a year ago and then we and it happened. And, and I can't tell you how many people told us it wouldn't happen. Like the BBC actively laughed in our face when we said we were going to do this. And then it happened. Like we actually did it in front of thousands of people. And it was no one had ever got drones because it was drones to talk to an actor and have a dialogue. Like no one had ever done it before. So we pulled it off and it was brilliant. But the thing that I'd never thought about, which is just joyful, is all these people on these plastic cones, when they lit up, they went nuts, mate. They just went, they just started cheering and jumping up and down and just be like, yeah. And, and the metaphor, the kind of, this long extended metaphor over 100 days just made total sense to them. And they were like, I'm the giant. I'm the giant now. And they just started dancing. And it's just so, so chuffed that people got it so quickly. Like, it's, it's storytelling on that scale is, is really hard because you don't get to do it very often. And when you do, you never get to see it. You don't get to draft it. And nobody had ever done it. And you yeah. risked it. I mean, because you couldn't no. test that, could you? You couldn't do practice runs or everyone would see it. It was amazing. And, the, and we had a brilliant drone company who do these things all over the world. But even they said, like, no one's ever tried to do this before. And yeah, we nailed, we nailed it. it. Like, God love her. I mean, the... Corinne Bailey Ray, you know, is an established star and for her to, to risk it and she had herself in her ear because it was the only way it could be timed. Otherwise it didn't work. And so that was really exciting. It went down really well. People really, really uh, enjoyed the metaphor. It was really good. So that was six, seven weeks ago. How is the momentum continuing? What's happening with it? Well, I mean, Leeds 2023 continues. I mean, the, the team there are brilliant. So so I, I was just brought in for the opening and I'll be brought in for the closing. You're going to have another giant? You can't tell us, can you? We're going to need to talk to you next year after the close. I have no idea because because we didn't know whether it would work. When it did work, which was brilliant, the success of that 
it leaves you some really good good problems. So you're like, well, how do you follow that, and how do you? And yeah. it's very different from doing something at the beginning of the year when everyone is um, quite cynical but hopeful to the end of the year where either they're going to be completely over it or they're going to be like, why don't we do this every year? Which in itself is a problem because we know that these things come from from the fact that we don't do them every year. They're tidal, aren't they? So, But the year continues. I think the really good thing about Leeds 2023 is its focus on community. So each each of the wards, there are 33 wards here, have their own programme, have their own champion. And I think that it's a really good example of how leadership changes the the meaning and content of a thing so there are lots of these years and they're very different but with color you get both the understanding for the need of spectacle of ambition that actually part of the job of the arts is to imagine other ways of being and then tell that story so 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 loudly and largely that it can't be denied and so i think for an incredibly corporate and often commercial city like leeds to have given away all the tickets for that concert really troubled people that then it was part of the fiction as well, really pissed them off because they were like, oh no, we can't even, because an artist was like, because we yeah. said from the very beginning, from the, how we announced this to all the way to the end is the, sh- is the show. So there is no such thing as a creative decision and a non-creative decision where normally people like me get ushered out of the room. No, 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 this is like, no, it's all creative. And that's, and, and that's really challenging for the organization. All of a sudden, uh, the artists had to be across the comms, the language, and they're like, no, get butt out. This is my job. And I'm like, well, it actually isn't this time. It's our job. Let's do it together. Are they happy with the result in retrospect? Do they all get it now? Won't they do it differently next time? I think there's a, no denying the show was incredibly successful. Like The press was amazing. The audience feedback was brilliant. And if anything, like the only problem you had was like local politicians saying, we, we should do this again. You're like, it cost a fortune. Don't do it again. But I think doing things differently is really hard, right? This is the whole point of what you do. It, it, people, it doesn't matter whether they're old men in a working men's club who sat on the committee since. There's someone on the committee who joined the club before the Second World War Whoa. and has been on the committee for as long as I've been alive. Wow. That's a lot, right? And you come along and you say, you know, his big thing was he didn't want there to be a lift because we've never had a lift, why do we need a lift? And I was like, dude, you're literally in a wheelchair. Well, I'll get helped up the stairs. It doesn't matter, the change is entirely positive and for the good. And legally required. I mean, don't even get me started on that. But it, it's just that it's changed, they'll fight it. And so, we, you know, even, even in people who work in the arts, and you would expect to be reasonably progressive and positive and everything else, they're still like, no, we don't like it like this. We don't, no, stop it, stop it. You know, so our big thing here is everything is pay what you decide, right? Which just means basically that you give it away to people who haven't got any money and you expect other people to engage a little bit. Drive people potty. Just tell me what it's worth. I'm like... I know, I've tried that. I, I had more emails that week from the pay what you decide. People go, but I don't know, give me a clue. Give me an idea. I, I, this, this, what would you like? change is hard right change is hard it's it's and it yeah. and it's even us for us like we we the whole point of us is Sunglow is constantly evolving we we run a food bank we run a football club we run a pub we run a warehouse we are just trying to be useful and kind within the within the belief that being beyond the market is a privilege and that's exhausting for us you know like everyone's like could we not just have a couple of months where we don't try and change the world i'm like well we could we could but we'll be bored and if we're going to do that, then actually, you know, we, we get paid the average wage of the nation here. Everyone gets paid, paid the same. If you want me to do less, I'm going to want more money. If you want, if you want me to behave like a normal artistic director of a, of a small producing th- theatre company outside of London, I'm going to want more cash. I'm kept here by the fact that life is hard and challenging and satisfying. That keeps me in my seat. If you're going to take that away from me, I'm going to want more cash. But we're not taking it away from you, Alan. It's amazing. (laughs) And I think that, given that I've held you in your seat for a lot longer than I had intended to, was there anything else that you would like to say to the assembled audience of the podcast? Then say it now. But that felt to me like a really good end. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time. And long may Leeds and Holbeck and Slunglow prosper. Thank you. So there we go. That's it for another week. I sincerely hope the sound files all stitched together well. We had some interesting technical difficulties towards the end. This was the second recording with Alan because the first one had even more technical difficulties and I can't tell you how grateful I am that he made the time. He is genuinely one of the busiest people I know and it feels to me that everything that he does 
is incredibly valuable. So I am beyond grateful that we had the time to talk to him today. And I hope that his integrity, his commitment, his standing in the rainness has impacted you as deeply as it has impacted me. Listening to Puran Desai last week and his sense that time really is running out has given me a greater sense of urgency even than I had already. And then here's Alan, who treats every day as urgent, who gets that we make the change by being the change. And it's so inspiring. And then the question for each of us, or certainly for me and I'm hoping for you, is what is it that I can do to make the most of the time that I have to be the change that needs to happen in my community. What can I do to be kind and be useful? So I leave you with that thought. We will be back next week with another conversation, as ever. And in the meantime, thanks to Kara C for wrestling with the technical difficulties, creating all the amazing sound and giving us the music at the head and foot. Thanks to Faith Tillery for the website and the conversations that keep us moving forward. Thanks to Anne Thomas for the transcripts, And, as always, enormous thanks to you for listening. We appreciate every single one of you. And if you know of anybody else who gets that we're in the time of transformation and that each of us can play our part in the emergence of the system that's coming, then please do send them this link. And that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you. And goodbye.